creative community. I'm your host David Starkey and my guest this time is poet, writer, journalist, disc jockey, <laughs> George Yachison. George, welcome. Thank you, David. Um, well, today we're mostly going to be talking about your poetry, okay. um, but I'm interested also in how you came to poetry. You came to poetry pretty early. You attended the prestigious Iowa Writers Workshop. You went a long time without writing poetry, but you've come back with a vengeance. <laughs> um, so uh, you have a new book out, The First Night We Thought the World Would End. Um, I'd love for our viewers to hear just a, a poem from that book. I'm sure I can do that. All right. Um, the book includes poems over 30 years of writing, so some of these are older than others, just okay. to get that out there. And this is probably an older one. Disappearances. Love is something to do with another dimension. Two people eating dinner, not talking as the sky outside gives in to darkness and the invisible birds chatter the nonsense of the day until someone, also unseen, claps once and the birds worry themselves into silence quickly so nothing is seen or heard and the couple smiles. See how their lips rise in unison, how their lips glisten with oils. It's not that they're just full leaving themselves behind as they rise and fall to the bed as they forget the couple eating, as the birds forget fear, as the singing begins, as the world rocks on its hips, as night opens like a flower, black petals bending, as night allows what it allows, and the bed falls away, and the birds fall away, and falling falls away till there's nothing, nothing but this. Wow. So, you know, I listen to your, your poem. I hear somebody with a, a great ear uh, for, for music. Um, and I was actually saying this to your wife, Christios, the other day. Okay. You, your poetry reminds me a little bit of my late friend David Cases. Um, okay. <laughs> and, and I always felt that he had just a superb ear for, for the way words went together to make sounds. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about the composition of a poem like that where Clearly, the content is, is crucial, but how it's said is maybe just as important as, as what is said. Yeah, I've, I, well, that's always been important to me in the work that I do. Even in the nonfiction that I do in the essays, I like writing to have texture, and, and that's all ear to me. Um, it, it's supposed to feel like something. And so the rhythms are important. Um, and so I'm very, very conscious of that from the beginning when I'm writing. And often that's how poems start for me is uh, a phrase or a line or a sentence mm -hmm. happens that just sounds good. And mm -hmm. it's like, okay, I have to write something about this. Something now. to go around yeah. that, <laughs> that phrase. <laughs> like that has to work somewhere. Yeah. Uh, and sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes yeah. it sits in a notebook for years and I right. keep trying to find it a home. And, right. you know. um, but definitely, that is one of my goals, and that's the kind of writing I tend to like, too. So I think well, that feeds yeah. what I try to do. I was going to say, I, mean, I know that you've done some, some teaching of poetry, and, and I've been mm -hmm. doing that as my job for the last 30-plus years. I, I know that students frequently will start more, not, it's not so much with a phrase or a sound, but wanting to communicate an emotion. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that's the primary goal of the poem is, I feel this way and I want you to know how I feel. Is that something that's also important to you? Uh, I don't care how anybody <laughs> thinks I feel. <laughs> no, um, in some ways, I guess. I mean, I, I tend to feel I'm more a lyric poet, but that might be simply because I'm really bad at narrative. Uh -huh. When, when, was, I was, what, when I was a kid, you know, when I was in undergrad, I thought that I was a fiction writer, too, you right. know, that I did everything. You know, yeah. I wanted to be the pump, pass, and kick, triple threat right. of writing, uh, and that wasn't so yeah. true. Because I, 
I don't really think well in narrative things. Even though I'm really good at when I'm watching things with narrative, I'm that horrible person who says they're going to go do this now. And <laughs> I'm usually right. Yeah, right. And then the person I'm watching with elbows it, it, me and right. is mad. Shut up, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm good at that, but coming up with it all on my own, okay. I'm not so good at. So it, yeah, it's an emotional thing. You're hoping that happens, obviously. I mean, what, what else would you want? Right, right, right. Um, but... Well, you know, so a, a narrative a narrative poet is a, is a storyteller. Yeah. Um, and for viewers who maybe don't read a lot of poetry, what what's a lyric poet? How would you how would you describe that? Uh, one that doesn't tell us <laughs> all the other poets. What they, yeah. What do they do uh, instead? Though? Again, it's trying to get feelings, emotions, situation that doesn't necessarily have to be resolved. I okay. think that's one of the things that I right. like about it too. Is you don't have that nice Freitag's pyramid of yeah. rising action and inciting incident. And right. Your poem could be anywhere denouement. along yeah, there. Yeah, that you can uh -huh. be all denouement. I think right. all my poems are just denouement. Right, right, <laughs> That's right. the first night the world would end. <laughs> denouement. The unraveling, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So tell um, us about that title. Yeah, it's actually, there is a poem with that title, but it's not in the book. Okay, why not? Perversely. <laughs> um, I, I'm still not sure how great a poem it is. Okay. Partially, it's... Uh, <laughs> It's also one of those poems that goes out of its way to say the uh, speaker is a horrible person, and mm. maybe I don't want to be quite as horrible as I present myself right, in that poem. Right, right. But you know, there's always that difference between the I in the poem right. and the I of the writer, which is hard for people to understand. I think often they assume poets, unless you're clearly writing a persona poem. Yeah. Uh, you know, you're pretending you're a, well, in fact, I think a chisel or something. Well, in fact, I think I made you know? my whole career on straddling that line. Yeah. Between, <laughs> is that really David or, yeah. or not? Yeah, so that's that's a... Uh, and and it, it's interesting, too, you know, because you do want to be thought well of as a human being even when the character you're writing is maybe despicable, mm -hmm. right? I mean, so, so you're always looking for some separation between those two. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, let's, let's hear another poem from... Right. Um, uh, your new book, and th this this is a book um, published by a local press. Yes. Tell us a little bit about the, the uh, press before you. Uh, Brandenburg Press is run by uh, Christopher Buckley, right. one of our fine local poets, right. um, who is retired now from a career he was at Riverside, I believe, he was, right? yeah. uh, UC Riverside, and he's here in town. He grew up here originally, so it's kind of a homecoming for him. And in addition to doing Miramar Magazine, a very fine magazine that's based locally and often includes many local poets right. but all kinds poets of from poets. all over the country yeah, yeah. Um, he occasionally publishes books and okay. said I want to publish your yeah, book that's so, great. thank you Chris yes thank you Chris <laughs> <laughs> um, okay uh, this one is called a reading and it has an epigraph from the poet Jack Spicer, which um, one of the things I love about this epigraph is it's iambic pentameter and doesn't sound like it. We find the body difficult to speak. My best poem would have no words, but now I am writing. Vacant at the mic, she eyed over the crowd, letting love lap in, what a room of listeners can do for you. While her work was like truth in its kimono at dawn, colors in full light, I could only latch on to one word as she twice misspoke epitaph for epigraph, as if such gist, a heartfelt coming or going, deserved merely a name. There are numerous words one must weigh out like change that jingle on the tongue's pocket, the way love tumbles about us so much. My friend, who had loved her alone but not for long, he had to watch her words, the right and wrong, leave lips his had touched, but no more for that. Instead, he had to watch her with another, watch hands at backs like fingers at a typewriter, the alphabet broken to keep favored keys from crashing, and the first words coming slow. That may be why we're so eager to get in bed with others, to hear one truth in silence, to settle into that clatter of nothing. That may be how she didn't misspeak, sensing words are for endings, epitaphs, when nothing else is left to say. Mm. Before you close that up, could, yeah. could you read the first line again? 
my best poem would have no words, <laughs> but now I'm writing. Yeah, and I, know, you know, I've <laughs> often felt that way too, that there is something ineffable that we're trying to express, and ironically, the only way we can kind of get at it is through words. Yeah. Um, why don't we just give up poetry and go for music instead? Um, well, in my case, because I'm a horrible musician. <laughs> <laughs> Having once been in a band right, briefly right, for right. Bass a, player. A, a slightly uh, 60 month period, maybe. Right, right. Yam, a great band of Central PA. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, there's that. And that's, that's one of the reasons why I stopped writing for a long time. You okay. mentioned that earlier that uh, there was a good 13 years or so that I didn't write any poetry. I was still doing a lot of journalism sure. and nonfiction writing. Teaching some writing and working for the Yeah, and teaching writing. But again, most university. of the writing I've taught, as opposed to you teaching poetry, was the writing students didn't want to have to take. Right, expository writing, yeah. <laughs> and a whole variety of genres and disciplines, because mm -hmm. that's what happens at uh, UCSB. But part of it was that, that um, my line was, you can only write the language as a tool that fails this poem for so long before you at mm -hmm. least convince yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> right. And you and should just stop. Yeah, <laughs> and, and I can remember talking to you during those years and, and always thinking, boy, George, you know, whenever I'd see your poems, boy, he's pretty good. I wonder why he doesn't <laughs> write any poems. But it was this kind of existential crisis in a way, wasn't it? I don't know. It didn't feel bad not doing it, uh -huh. and it didn't necessarily feel great doing it right, again, but right. it's like, oh yeah, I can do this again. Yeah, yeah. I mean, a, a lot of that was just life situation and winding up married to a poet who, it was, uh, put me back in the poetry world much more prominently, going to readings, mm -hmm. hanging out with other cool poets like perhaps you. Right, right. Um, and that just sort of got me going again, and then part of that was trying to write at the same time as Chris, mm -hmm. my wife, mm -hmm. um, and making sure we were doing all that, so. Tell me, well, so let's go back to, um, you went to the University of Iowa, mm -hmm. which is, uh, for folks who know Creative Writing Renowned, is one of the best uh, programs in the country, and, and you were in, uh, first you, you did poetry and then you did nonfiction. And tell me a little bit about the, the folks you worked with when you were uh, studying poetry. Yeah, I was really lucky, I mean, Iowa always has great people. Great people come to visit many times through the, the semester. So you get to see like all the greats, or you did. So this was back in the middle 80s. And the four standard faculty then were Joy Graham, Marvin Bell, uh, Gerald Stern, and Jim Galvin. And so I worked with most of them. And Tom Lux was there for a whole semester. So he, I did a workshop with him too. Mm -hmm. So it was, it was an incredible experience. I mean, there, you want to stay in grad school forever. forever <laughs> when you get to do that. Cause, well, you know, what, what did you, anything you took away from any of those individual poets or anything that you resisted? Sometimes I've found in graduate school that the, the people I, I didn't want to write like were just as influential <laughs> as the people I did. Yeah, I think it tends to be a little bit of both those things sometimes. Um, I think... There's definitely, sometimes I worry with some of my poems, it's like, oh, that's a real Jim Galvin poem. I mm -hmm. think what he was doing then, I haven't been reading his stuff as much lately, um, but what he was doing then definitely clicked with things that were interesting. And, and what was he doing? Just the, the way that he could write, it was clear that he wanted lines to pay off individually in poems mm -hmm. in ways that not everybody does, I think. And I like that idea of how can you sort of make a poem seem like every line is a first line. Mm -hmm. And that's another thing that I like to try to do is really hit the ground running in poems. I don't know if I do it all the time. But to really have people go, oh, that, wait, he, he made me think something in a different way mm -hmm. or hear something mm -hmm. in a different way or see something in a different way and get their attention. I, I, again, that might go back to having written journalism for so long mm -hmm. and trying to do leads. And get the Lord knows out. how many of those I've done. And it's like, well, how do I do it this time? What's different? Right, you know, right. And I'm sure I've repeated little tricks of my own many a time in different ways, both in poetry and in journalism. Right, right. <laughs> well, inevitably, yeah. But even with that, I think sometimes you find within those just enough variation that it's something interesting, or at least that's what I hope. Well, and I think too that again, to, for viewers who may not read a lot of poetry, that's one of the difficulties about reading a poem is that 
rather than just reading to the right uh -huh. margin and flipping <laughs> around like this, you, you stop and you might start stop here, but you might stop here. And the sense that you're, each line has its own integrity. And as, as you're saying, uh -huh. ideally each has its own kind of oomph uh, yeah. as you go through. Um, that's one of the poet's biggest task, isn't it, mm -hmm. writing a poem? Yeah, I mean, if, we, if we're not doing that, we might as well just write prose. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which sometimes you hear people read poetry right. and you go, eh, this yeah, is really prose, just yeah, yeah. arbitrary line yeah. lengths. Well, yeah. let's, let's, I'm going to use that as a, as a segue <laughs> into um, what you did after that, which was to study prose, yes. uh, creative nonfiction. Yeah. Uh, so um, you've been working with all these great poets. What made you think, oh, I'm now going to try a different genre? Again, I'd been doing journalism for a long time, and that interested me. And I'd always kind of liked essayists in that form. And the good thing about creative nonfiction, when you're doing an essay, in the same ways that poetry should have some form to it, not that I usually write in strict form, but I am thinking about how it looks on the page, what am I doing, why the lines are long or short, all that kind of stuff. The essay, the very shape of an essay should sort of embody part of what it is. It means like to essay out, you know, mm -hmm. to weigh out, to figure stuff out. And like poetry, it's better if you don't know where you're going to end when you start writing it. I think okay. why are you writing a poem or writing an essay if you know where you're going to finish? Mm -hmm. Go write an editorial or something. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why political poetry is so hard because you're so set in your ways already you're not you know be what learning you're anything. Say, yeah, I mean, right. the, the poem should teach you something mm -hmm. too. And essays do that, and um, that can be really fun. And there's just so much good stuff. Uh, the person who was running the nonfiction writing workshop at that time at Iowa, Carl Klaus, is just a masterful teacher too. He was just so good at helping you learn how to read other people's essays from Orwell to Didion, and so good in workshop. It, helping people get better, mm -hmm. and that was just really attractive. It was mm -hmm. really fun. Yeah. Well, I want to shift a little bit again to now to, uh, to your writing about food and wine, um, mm -hmm. because um, <coughs> I, I have had meals with you. <laughs> uh, lucky me. Um, uh, whether you're uh, you know cooking or mm -hmm. or uh, picking out the restaurant. And, and I know that you have a kind of poetic sensibility <laughs> when you're looking for what's going to be mm -hmm. on, on the plate, what's going to be in the glass. Um, it, there is a kind of poetry to that, obviously, wouldn't you say? I, I would hope, yeah. yeah. I, I want to, you know, there's always that kind of joke, particularly when you like to drink wine and cocktails and things, that you romance all the accoutrements around it, you know, cocktails and the cocktail shakers and right. the whole idea of, you know, Dorothy Parker and all these wonderful things when really all you want to do is just get <laughs> drunk just and you're trying to come up with a fancy way to do this. But no, it's this made with yeah. this liqueur. Um, <laughs> and that can happen with food, obviously, too. But yeah, there is a poetry to it. Again, I think one of the things I love so much about that is how you have to be keenly aware and enjoying it as you're enjoying it because it's going away. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know. Yeah, and, the, and so I. The that, first time we thought the world would end, you know, <laughs> <right>. again, <laughs> that idea of, you know, I, it, personally, out late, as you know, my, our life story for me and my wife has been very dramatic. And so it's not like. I, I want to always live on that knife edge of mortality, mm -hmm. but it, it's a poignant thing and a kind of beautiful thing to think about when you're eating and drinking that this is it, you're enjoying it here, mm -hmm. you have to appreciate it. Um, sometimes that becomes more than you want it to in life. Right, right. right well, I, uh, since we were talking about that, you have a chapbook mm -hmm. called Feast Days mm -hmm. uh, that uses that as kind of a, a central theme. Um, could you read us a poem from Sure. That? The now out of print feast day, sadly. <laughs> well, but back in print. I think the company has come back. Really? Oh, yes, she's come back? Is. I didn't receive, I didn't hear that. All right. This, <clears throat> sorry. It's still a little bit allergy season, so. This one will fit, I think, particularly with what we were just talking about. One sad math. You have to eat a pound of dirt before you die, so it makes sense to stop at 15 ounces. Then the skinny guy with the scythe could only marvel at your cleanliness, pass you by as you glitter transfigured. Alas, 
Someday on some grubby farmer's stand, a bulb of celeriac will wink its bland, blotted eye, or so it will surely seem. The richness of root, the steady center, a whiff of truffle, and then the taste of soil, which it turns out we all love, a fine thing given even without a mouthful of rapacium. It's where we're all headed amidst all the other lovely things underground. What is rapacium? It's just the Latin name for celery root. Oh, okay. <laughs> One of the fun things when you write about food is you get to throw in all right, those Latin yeah, names. Yeah. <laughs> well, as you were writing about poetry about food, did you find yourself stealing you know, some tricks and things from your, your prose writing about it or not so much? Sometimes, yeah, because I. it depends on the kind of prose writing I'm doing. Often I do a lot of writing in town for the independents, say, for years and years for food. And there it's usually journalism driven and interview driven. And so it's a little less room for me to be pushing the nonfiction edge of things. Mm -hmm. And often if I try to do that, I, it seems like it might be edited more back <laughs> into neat little, you put, this is way too long a complex right. sentence, yeah. George, we're gonna break it in. I've noticed that with my book reviews, sometimes it's like yeah. a little too flowery yeah. that it, it doesn't appear in print. Yeah, or they it's don't get it and yeah. edit it into something that doesn't make sense. Right. Um, uh, the, the editor journalist struggle. So yeah, in some ways it does sometimes, because. You know, that depends on the mm -hmm. instance, but right. definitely. Well, another area I mentioned when I was introducing you was, was radio. And I know when you were a kid, basically, back at Johns Hopkins, yeah. uh, you, you got on the radio and you uh, were in love with it. And for folks who may have been listening to this uh, program with their eyes closed, they might recognize your voice <laughs> if they listen to KCSB. Uh, yes. Tell me a little bit about... Um, the radio show you have, it's been around for a long time and how it got started and, and what you yeah. guys are up to. Yeah, somehow this October will be nine years that wow. we've been on the air, which is hard to believe because when I did radio as an undergrad and grad student in Baltimore and Iowa, I did it for seven years then and that seemed like a long time and it's longer now. Right, right. <laughs> but uh, the show now is Frank and George. We're on Tuesday mornings, 10 a.m. to 12 noon. And in the parlance of KCSB, it's an eclectic show, which means we play pretty much whatever we want. Right. And we really like to try to expand that in a lot of different directions. I mean, there's some areas we don't head into a whole lot. We don't do a ton of rap because neither one of us know it very well and we're not in safe harbor, so it's too hard to edit it. Mm -hmm. right. <laughs> so you can play it. Uh, we don't do a lot of speed metal, but mm -hmm. we have played it occasionally. Right. You know. But we have a theme each week, and my co-host, Frank Ode, who's a fine artist who did the cover, actually, for ah, okay. this book. Nice. Um, it's from a painting of his, and he designed the book for me. Uh, he, we, you know, try to have a little musical conversation based around some theme. He tends to play a lot of jazz because he's older than I am. That is possible. <laughs> and, <laughs> and uh, but yeah, we try to do all kinds of stuff. It's, it's just a lot of fun. I don't know. I, I like doing radio. Right, yeah. I mean, I, and I, I think that your wide knowledge of music uh, often creeps into your poetry, uh, you know, again, inevitably. Yeah. Um, well, if viewers are watching and they're like, well, I kind of like this guy's uh, work, um, <laughs> how might they purchase it here if they're, they're going to be watching on the Central Coast uh -huh. in, in Ventura or Santa Barbara counties? Okay. Um, the book is available at uh, Chaucer's and Tecolote. Okay. And it is Santa on Barbara Amazon. Santa Barbara and Montecito. Yeah. yeah so. And on Amazon. Yes. Okay. Always a quick way to go. Uh, nobody makes a lot of money. but No. <laughs> I, I, somehow they keep charging me money for doing yeah, this. Okay. I don't understand. <laughs> <laughs> well, we got about, um, gosh, I looked down, we got about three and a half minutes left. I, I'd love to okay. hear at least one more poem from the first night we thought the world would end. Okay. Let me. What about the seeing apparatus again. What do I have for you here? Uh, which one do I want? Well, it seems like all I do is write poems about readings here because this takes place at another reading, but this one's called Stage Whisper. We only give away what we know we'll get more of or get again, and stories are like pennies or paper clips. So much in supply, most we don't bother to collect. 
finding our pockets, our papers, our lives full enough, fat, with things outside need. Outside, the universe is tired of expanding, and like us on a return trip, everything seems trebly fast, and like us during love, slowing down seems valuable and impossible, coming to what, leaving from where. So quiet she is as you lean right past her words, trying to hear her. And those parts in French which you don't speak, beautiful, a constellation of roses, a bee lost in the syrupy soda, dying and wanting to sting, leaving the tongue numb and blazing. If you understood it, wouldn't help you. It's time to play. Let's take out our stories and dress them like dolls. Yes, pretty, pretty there, pretty, pretty. Shh. Hmm. Do you do you have one more really short poem that I could <laughs> talk you into trying to squeeze um, it into our last? Really last short. Two I didn't pick one, but I know there's a good. Put probably. you on the spot here. Yeah. This will be a truly pleasant way to end. Okay. <laughs> this one's called Bitter. Not in my life, but on my tongue. We can take them when we know they know limits. That bitter is written in an increment of eyelashes. Food needs its sense of fear, so we savor with a sense of endings, like a kid in a Halloween graveyard saying, this is what death is, far from afraid, but wise with a new knowing, like gunmetal in the mouth. Wow. <laughs> What's the origin of that one? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Liking Halloween yeah. and... Uh, yeah, maybe we and don't want to taking know. a little too far. Yeah, <laughs> well, in, in the last minute that we have together, George, it, for people out there who are writing poetry, uh, it's actually less than a minute. What, what's this, some a piece of advice that you would give to somebody who wants to write poetry but hasn't really started yet? Read, read, read. Uh -huh. read. Just get a lot of other voices in your head and and read very consciously, trying to take things apart. Why do I like this? How could I do something like this? Where do we, where do I find the books if I'm this person? Uh, library is a good place. Uh -huh. Empire Public Library is a great okay. poetry collection, and they will help you find stuff. Jace Turner, our yes. great uh, librarian over there, mm -hmm. will probably make some recommendations yeah. or two. Well, it has been a great pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you so much. Thank you, David. The Creative Community is produced with a generous grant from the Diana and Simon Robb Foundation. I'm your host, David Starkey. Thanks for watching.